Um, it's great to be here back in Nashville. And it's great to be at the festival, uh, which just seems like a great event. And congratulations on all your work. Do I need to use this? No. Okay, good. Uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, and tell you about the Freedom Rides and about the mug shots that enabled me to, to do my book, Breach of Peace. And then uh, Rip Patton, uh, our special guest, as Nancy said, uh, will talk a little bit about his experience in Nashville and in Mississippi as a Freedom Rider. Um, we're here today because of the remarkable events of 48 years ago. Uh, the Freedom Rides are really the third major uh, campaign in the modern civil rights movement. In late 1955, of course, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus, a city bus in Montgomery, and, and thus began the bus boycott there. In February 1964, black college students in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, walked into a Woolworths one morning and began the sit-in movement which spread like wildfire in cities and towns across the South and was very successful in desegregating many businesses. In 1961, the movement was asking itself the question, okay, what do we do next? How do we continue to up the ante? How do we put even more pressure on the system and force change? The Freedom Ride was James Farmer's idea, and this is his mugshot from Jackson. Uh, Farmer was the newly installed head of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and he knew that in 1960 the Supreme Court had ruled that segregation in bus and train stations was illegal. He also knew that southern stations were, so, were still segregating and that the federal government was making no effort to enforce the law. So he and his colleagues envisioned a demonstration ride through the South uh, by a small group of riders, black and white, integrating stations along the way and trying to draw some attention to the situation. So May 14th, I'm sorry, May 4th, uh, 13 riders, like I said, a mixed group of black and white men and women, left Washington on two buses. Their final destination was New Orleans on May the 17th, which would have been the seventh anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. And now as you can see from the, the map on the wall, the, at the time of the Freedom Rides started, Jackson was but one stop along the way, and yet ultimately became the focus of the Freedom Rides. How did that happen? Uh, the original 13 riders made their way through the Upper South without too much incident. There was some violence in Rock Hill, South Carolina. However, when they arrived, in Alabama on Sunday, May 14th, which was Mother's Day, all hell broke loose. Uh, a bus arriving in Anniston was set upon by the mob, its tires slashed and forced off the road, at which point someone threw a firebomb in the bus and blocked the door, preventing the Freedom Riders from getting out. They almost burned to death before they finally managed to escape. Later that same day, when, the, when a second group of Freedom Riders got off the bus in Birmingham, they were set upon by a mob and beaten for several minutes before the police showed up. Where were the police? Bull Connor said later he had given them the day off so they could spend it with their mothers. After these two attacks, the Freedom Rides basically collapsed. Uh, but the effort was revived by reinforcements from the National Student Movement. Uh, I'm skipping over a lot of history here that you can read in Ray Arsenault's book called Freedom Rides or in other books like David Halberstam's The Children. Uh, and Rip, I think, will talk a little bit about this when he gets up here. But, but Nashville, the student movement here, was, was one of the preeminent movements in the South in the Civil Rights Movement, and they recognized the danger. And immediately after these two attacks, they started sending people into Montgomery, I'm sorry, to Birmingham to keep the rides going. And about a week later, on the 20th of May, the rides pressed on to Montgomery. Once again, when they arrived at the station, the police were nowhere to be found, and the riders were left alone to face the mob. John Lewis was hit in the head with the Coca-Cola crate. Reporters were also attacked, and John Siegenthaler, who at that time was working for Bobby Kennedy in the Department of Justice, was hit in the head with a pipe and knocked out. At this point, there were calls from pretty much every corner of the establishment for the Freedom Rides to come to a halt, uh, 
from the media, including the New York Times, who said the writers would be overreaching if they continued their campaign into Mississippi. Uh, mainstream civil rights organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League were, had never been too happy about this take it to the streets, uh, nonviolent direct action approach that these young kids like Rip here were embracing. It made them nervous. They much preferred to work in the courts. Uh, so they weren't too keen on the rides either. And of course, the Kennedy administration was desperate to get uh, pictures of burning buses and bloody beaten riders off the front pages of newspapers, not only in this country, but around the world. Um, and the images from Aniston uh, went everywhere. Um, and Kennedy was new in office. He was just about to go to Vienna to have his first uh, meeting with Khrushchev. And, and these were not pictures, this is not the image of the United States that he needed to be projecting. He wanted to be projected at this point in the Cold War. Um, the writers, however, were undeterred. And they said, we're going to continue on our way. So Bobby Kennedy got on the phone with Mississippi officials and said, whatever happens, you can't let them get beaten up anymore. And Mississippi said, we will protect them but we might do that by arresting them all. So on May 24th, 27 riders, including Rip, left Montgomery in two buses and headed into Jackson, unaware of the backroom deal that had been cut between Bobby Kennedy and Mississippi. Uh, all of them worried about what would happen once they arrived in Jackson. Uh, many of them thought they might die there uh, or along the way. Instead, on their arrival, for the first time in four stops, there was no mob, just a lot of policemen who quickly and quietly arrested the riders and took them off to jail. Well, here's a front page of story from the Clarion Ledger in Jackson uh, the day after the riders arrived. 27 mixers, that's what, one of the names that the riders had. They were also like, the, the newspaper and uh, government agencies also like to call them the so-called freedom riders. Um, so we see arrests made quietly, trial is set for Friday. Here's a blow up of that page. You see that in the second paragraph there, they were charged with refusing to obey an officer and committing a breach of the peace, uh, which I think is a wonderful charge. Uh, breach of peace is a pretty simple misdemeanor charge. It's not a felony. It has no racial component. Cities in the South love to use this charge to arrest people uh, because it allowed them no uh, recourse to, uh, uh, to go to court and appeal on any kind of constitutional basis, their arrest. You'll also see no attempt had been made to post bond, which has been set at $500 on each charge. Um, I think once everybody had been quietly arrested and safely arrested, Mississippi and, and the Kennedy administration thought, okay, we've, we've solved the problem. Nothing bad happened like in Alabama. We're kind of getting on top of this situation. Um, but in fact, they had made a big mistake. And the writers realized that. And, and they, the writers adeptly abandoned their original destination of New Orleans and instead adopted the strategy of jail, no bail. They refused to pay their fines and bail out. Instead, they invited new writers to come to Jackson uh, and fill, get arrested and fill the jails to overflowing. This was the Gandhian tactic of using the system against itself and forcing the nation and the federal government to confront and address segregation. So you can see what this looked like you know, a few days later on May 28th, and again from the Clarion Ledger, mixed writers aim attacks at Jackson. And people from all over the country responded to this call, and an ad hoc freedom rider organization quickly sprung up to send riders into Jackson via three primary staging cities, uh, in addition to Montgomery, New Orleans, and Nashville. And riders would come from all over the country to gather in these three cities, uh, maybe get a day or two of training in nonviolence, what to do if you're attacked, what to do when you're arrested. And then they would be assembled into slightly larger groups of five or eight or ten and be sent into Jackson on buses. And here's a picture of the Greyhound station that's still standing. It's an architect's office today. Uh, and the trailway station's been torn down, but the, bus, the train station is still standing. Um, 